into this. Now we're the first test we're going to do is this uh, the steering and suspension test 11 where we're going to be talking a little bit about Lincoln active suspension. And I'm going to give you a few highlights and then we're going to go over this uh, test. Now if you hear me stumble across anything that happens to be the answer to one of your questions, uh, make sure that you put the answer in there. So uh, this is steering and suspension test 11. Well in 1995 Lincoln introduced active suspension on the Continental and that incorporates rear air leveling, load, road calibrated suspension, ride control, variable steering assist, all in one system. They put all that stuff in the same box. And that road cali uh, calibration, uh, calibrated suspension system automatically switches the shock absorber between soft and hard. We talked about that a little last week. And it maintains the vehicle at a proper level and it varies under various conditions of vehicle load. Okay, so it's got its onboard diagnostics, but a system malfunction may not always produce a di diagnostic trouble code. Now that's annoying because you always want to pull a code, see what it is, change a part, and be done, right? Done. That how often does that happen? Sometimes. Yeah. Often. You know we see that. So what happens? You know, like on the on the one like Ms. Moody's. I mean, Ms. Uh, Moody's worked on uh, Michelle's car, and uh, whenever he got a, a, if what happens if you get a code telling you that, that for instance, on an engine control system that you've got a lean condition, is the, is it going to tell you which part to replace? No, it's not. You're going to be looking for something that's causing that, right? A little vacuum leak, something like that. All right. But anyway, uh, this guy's talking about a 97 Lincoln that arrived with a complaint of an intermittent hard suspension and increased steering effort. And they drove it, were able to verify it. The suspension became really hard and there was a complete lack of power assist. The check ride control warning was displayed on the message center, but the scan tool didn't find any codes in the memory. Now that is really irritating, right? Before they dove in too deep, they decided to investigate how it worked. So the brains behind it is the vehicle dynamics control module. That's the VD, VDCM, remember that. Governs the ride control, variable assist power steering, and it's got a 60 pin connector, which is like the engine controller on that old Bronco out there, as far as the same number of pins and the shape of it. And it adjusts the suspension from plush to normal settings when a vehicle uh, speed exceeds 85 miles an hour. Now, why would they want it to go to normal? I mean, what's plush? Soft. Yeah. You know, and they want it to go hard when you hit 85 miles an hour. So why do they want it to go hard? You're less likely to turn over with hard suspension than you are. I guess those Humvees have got really hard suspension, don't they? They just bounce your oh, uh, yeah, yeah, all that yeah, yeah. stuff, right? The ride control is going to return from firm to normal at 90 and the plush setting at 80. The suspension setting, you notice how it doesn't change at one speed, it actually changes at one speed and then it goes down below that speed to go back the other way. It's a sort of a window there. Okay, the suspension settings will automatically stiffen through three levels when it experiences high roll and pitch maneuvers and when the vehicle accelerates. And uh, these, you know what pitch and roll is, right? Pitch and roll. You guys don't fly a whole lot, do you? Yeah, pitch and roll. What y'all? You know, back and forth. So basically, pitch and roll, you know, rolls like this and pitches like this, right? Basically, and, and vehicles can do that. Uh, but they don't appear on the message center. They're all processed by the vehicle dynamics control module and are not apparent to the driver. Uh, three settings can be manually selected, though, uh, and steering effort, uh, you get firm, normal, and plush, and then steering effort can be selected in the same manner, but the vehicle dynamics module will automatically prevent the selection of both low steering effort and firm ride setting at the same time. It ain't going to let you have, you know, low steering effort and firm ride setting together. Uh, you know, because it, it tends to be unsafe. Well, the rear air suspension system is microprocessor controlled and it's an active air suspension system and the support hardware, you know, the processor and support hardware are contained in the vehicle dynamic control module and it constantly determines the height position of the vehicle body relative to vehicle wheels. It maintains a predetermined trim height regardless of road conditions or trim or passenger load. Uh, so if you load a bunch of fat people in there, it's going to go... <laughs> And come up nice and flat, right? Uh, during normal operation, the vehicle dynamics control module uses a 45 second averaging interval for controlling operations. Got that? All right, the 45 second averaging interval is used to keep the control module uh, from making uh, unneeded corrections. And when a vehicle at the correct trim height hits a bump, the air suspension height sensor output will read low and high. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's going to blink low and high. If the control module were to correct for those bump-induced readings, the duty cycle would increase unnecessarily. Right? 
So the 45 second averaging interval not only eliminates corrections due to bumps, but it also eliminates unnecessary changes resulting from parking, accelerating, and turning. The control module tabulates the height sensor reading and does not begin compressure or vent operation until the air suspension height sensor reads low or high for 45 seconds continually. If you notice how on these Chevy pickups, it's got the daytime running lights. And you get out there in the sun and you put this thing in drive with your foot on the brake, how long does it take those lights to come on? 45 seconds or something like that. So 45 seconds is, a, is their favorite timeout. But when you're waiting for it to happen, it seems like a maternity. Yes, it's terrible. All right, so the control module, uh, it's going to tabulate all that, uh, basically, and it's going to do it with a, with a little bit of a delay. The vehicle speed input comes from ABS wheel speed sensors and is relayed by the ABS module to the VDCM. We talked about that a little bit via the MCN data link. When the vehicle speed is less than 10 miles an hour, full power assist is needed. Air suspension service switch is mounted in the luggage compartment and must be turned off when the vehicle is hoisted, jacked, towed, or jump-started. Now, the people that drive these vehicles it seemed to me like if somebody was going to change a tire and they weren't used to driving or even weren't even thinking clearly, a lot of times when you're in a hurry, you're just not thinking clearly, and you don't automatically say, I've got to remember to turn off the air suspension switch. You know, sometimes you forget to do that. When you go to jack it up and it starts trying to level things up, it actually causes to fall off the jack, which is kind of dangerous, you know, so you need to make sure you know where that stuff is. Height sensors provides a voltage signal that corresponds to vehicle ride height. When it's fully compressed, it'll send a signal of four and a half volts. When the sensor is fully extended, it's a half a volt. Got that? Four and a half volts when it's compressed, half a volt when it's... And what kind of sensor is that? Is that, is that digital or analog? Excuse me? Analog? Got to be analog because it's varying between four and a half and five volt. I mean, 0.5 volts, right? Uh, all positions in between will result in a linear voltage signal according to the position of the sensor. That's what analog is all about. So the VDCM responds to signals from sensor inputs to maintain the desired ride height. When it's either moving or stopped, it accomplishes that by opening and closing individual solenoid valves. Uh, and so the resistance of the vent solenoid should be between 14 and 18 ohms. Remember that. Power steering assist also controls the amount of power steering assist, and that depends on vehicle speed. The control module uh, activates the steering control valve actuator, and that's modulated to open valve orifices in order to obtain the desired hydraulic flow to the steering gear. And that signal has a nominal value of 208 hertz. What does that mean? 208 hertz. What's 208 hertz? What's frequency? Uh, What's a hertz? What's, waves, What's one hertz? What's one hertz? Bingo. One cycle per second is a hertz, right? And megahertz is whenever you fall on something sharp, you know, I guess, whatever. But anyway, megahertz would be millions of cycles per second, whatever. Okay. Uh, the duty cycle between zero and 100%. So, right, you got that? You got duty cycles. So 200 cycles per second, duty cycle between zero and 100%. Uh, you know, duty cycles basically is 100% uh, is on all the time, zero percent off all the time. Anything in between there is divided between zero and 100%. Your scan tool's got the ability to supply diagnostic trouble codes and read data stream and perform certain output functions. And when the check ride control message is displayed, it has detected a system malfunction that is stored in memory. That's what all these computers do. Uh, DTCs can be retained for 80 ignition switch cycles. If the malfunction doesn't repeat during 80 ignition switch cycles, the control module will erase the diagnostic trouble code from memory. Uh, the air suspension system will be disabled whenever a, uh, something, a fault occurs. And if the condition causing the problem clears during the current ignition switch cycle, the system will even reactivate. In other words, if you have a problem that comes on you and it deactivates the system, even if the problem goes away, it's not going to reactivate the system. You know, it's going to wait till you key off and go back on again. Um, so if it's got an overloaded luggage compartment, let's say, it won't be able to return the vehicle without exceeding the compressor runtime. So if the compressor's got to run too long so that it's going to get hot, it just shuts everything down and it just lets you ride squatting. You know what I mean? That's the deal on that. Uh, the customer will experience poor ride quality and the vehicle will not make adjustments until the, vehicle, the key is cycled again. You ever ride in a vehicle that the springs are flat on it? I mean, that the air springs are flat? It is bone jarring. It's worse than bouncing across the desert on a Humvee. Cheap coil like that too. Huh? Cheap coil like that too. Yep. You got it. During the wiggle test, you know what a wiggle test is? What's a wiggle test? You're going to put it in a mode so that if a fault happens, it'll light off the buzzer on your tool, and you're going to jiggle that wire harness. And if, it, if something shorts, it's not supposed to be shorted, or opens, it's not supposed to be open, it'll go beep, beep, 
beep, beep, beep, beep, beep. That's a wiggle test. You know that during the wiggle test, several inputs and outputs of the VTCM are monitored for change of state while the harnesses are manipulated. Uh, you need something to tell you what's going on while you're manipulating the harnesses. If you manipulate the harnesses and you don't have something to indicate that you fixed the problem, then you're going to fix the problem and you didn't know what you did to fix it, and it's going to work back over and the problem's going to come back, and whatever labor time you charge is going to have to be on you, especially if you're on commission, because you didn't fix it the first time. You just made it go away for a while. That's bad. So make sure you, it's best to let your, don't let your fingers do the walking to start with. You just look and see what's shorted before you do anything else. And you know, you know what you're looking for, right, Moody? You're looking for a, uh, a wire harness either laying on a, across a sharp, a sharp bracket or on a hot pipe or anything like that. Got me? Get, get, get used to that. Active command modes. Who knows what an active command mode is? Tell me about an active command mode. A two-way talking scan tool. You're basically telling it to do something so you can see if it can do it. Just do whatever. Yeah, anything that you can tell it to do, if you can say, see, if it's making the decisions, you don't know if it's being told, if it's decided to do anything or not. But if you can override that, if you can do an uh, operator override with your scan tool, and you can say, I want you to energize this component, and you go, Dum, and then you see if that component's energized. If it's not, what do you do next? I'm going to look at the wires. I mean, like, if I don't see the component energized, and I, let's say I'm going down there, I say, this component's got a ground, and it's got power that's delivered to it by this module. I'm going to put some indicator down there. I'd really, if it's a load, I want to check it with a test light. If it's a, a sensor signal, I want to check it with a meter, right? But I'm just making sure my, I little, got a little test light down there, and I'm going to say, okay, I want you to turn on that circuit. Doom. If that light doesn't light up, I'm checking wire. I need to know if it's on the ground or the hot side, right? Two, so that's what, well, yeah, pneumatic test. Here's one of the active command modes. Each rear corner of the vehicle is pumped for five seconds and vented for five seconds, and it monitors the corresponding height sensor for the proper ride height transmission. So transition. So that's what's the feedback? What you're getting the feedback is the height sensor. From the, height the actuator is the you know your pump is actually sending juice out there. It's going to open that air spring. It's going to let air in there, and it's going to watch that height sensor and it's say, is it raising up? All right. If it tells you if it's going every all four corners. And you see that's funny whenever you watch it do it. It goes, and all that. And it's watching those height sensors. So I can say, look, I pumped this back end up, but I didn't see a height sensor change. And so there's one of two things going on. Either it didn't pump up, or this high sensor is lying to me, or it's the high sensor disconnected. But if you saw it go up and down, what do you know? You know it's probably height sensor related. If you didn't see it go up and down, I'm going to be looking at my spring or my solenoid or something like that. You got it? This ain't complicated. If you think about it the right way, you can go right to it. What's really silly is when you call the hotline and they tell you something, it's just so simple, you could have thought of it yourself. And you're thinking, oh, I'm wasting my time here. I yeah, I know, and it, it, it does happen. Uh, it happens around here sometimes, doesn't it, uh, uh, Bobby? All right, this test is dependent on the electrical system and may yield a pneumatic test diagnostic trouble code when an electrical condition is present. That's what I was talking about earlier. Since it can't con detect compressor relay and height sensor open circuit faults, they may trigger pneumatic DTCs. Okay, this mode allows the technician, semi-active ride control is another one. It lets the technician command the vehicle dynamics module to turn on, uh, turn on any of the four shock absorbers, soft or firm. See? And then it's going to look at that. During the shock absorber soft and bouncing on the corresponding fender, the operator ought to be able to freely bounce the vehicle. In other words, I'm going to tell it to make this one firm, and then I'm going to try to bounce it and see if it's firm. And I'm going to tell it to make it soft, and I'm going to try to bounce it. And I can tell. You know, you can tell. See how easy that is? Nothing to it. You got to know how to get into there. So, uh, air suspension diagnostic control, that lets the technician pump and vent the air spring solenoids on, on individually. Now, this is you telling it to do what it was doing automatically earlier. Uh, the vent solenoid check ride control message and the height sensor power can be cycled. In other words, I can actually turn on the check ride control if I want to with this scan tool. All right. The, the vent solenoid is automatically activated when the compressor is turned on and the air spring solenoids are turned off to reduce the load on the comp compressor during testing. The compressor does not like to run a really long time because it heats that little sucker up. And if you look at those compressors, a lot of them will have a little temperature sensor on the side of the cylinder that the piston goes up and down in. And it starts to heat up, it'll go off. I mean, it'll shut down. And uh, that's basically a little thing for you know protecting it. Now we're almost through here, so you guys don't turn into skeletons. 
the ride height calibration is designed to recalibrate the vehicle dynamics module to program a new nominal ride height, and that eliminates the need for the mechanically adjusting the ride height sensors. Now, this is how you do that. On these Lincolns, what you do, and I went to school on this, you got your scan tool, your worldwide diagnostic system, what we were using at the time, which is kind of like our IDS that we got. And uh, basically, you're going to measure from the fender down to the uh, bottom of the rim, not, the, not to the ground, but from the fender to the rim, because that's a constant. You got me? I mean, that's a dependable. If the tires are low, if the tires are under inflated or something, you know, it's not going to be to the ground, it's not going to be accurate. So I'm going to go to the bottom of the rim, from the bottom of the rim of the fender, and I'm going to push that into my machine, and I'm going to tell it what it is. And it's going to compare it to what it knows it's supposed to be, and it's going to recalibrate accordingly. Now, you can lie to it, and the guy did that at the school. It was funny as all get out. He took his Lincoln, this poor Lincoln that we jerked around. It was a red one. It was really cool looking, you know, Mark 8. So he takes that thing, and he measured it, and then he tells it that it's a lot lower than it really is in the front and a lot higher than it is really in the back, and he goes, you know. <laughs> I mean, it went up and down like that. So, I mean, but that was just something he just showed us you could do. But basically, you're using a really high-end, you know, scan tool to do this kind of thing. I think you can do it with that little one that you were using this morning on the, you know, uh, the accurate trim test should be done when attempting to measure ride height. So uh, that commands the vehicle dynamics control module to adjust air suspension to each rear corner of the vehicle within plus or minus two millimeter of design height as defined by the current height sensor adjustment and ride height calibration. Uh, no trouble codes are displayed unless a fault's encountered during the accurate trim operation. Got it? Okay. Yeah. Upon reaching normal ride height, the scan tool will display system passed and the ride height should be measured before the alignment procedure is performed. Uh, what alignment? What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Wheel alignment. Yeah. Ride height will affect wheel alignment. Wheel alignment. Yeah. Now turning back to our problem. Okay. After performing the usual test for power and ground and looking at the data stream from the scan tool, uh, it was convinced that the vehicle dynamics control module was commanding this condition. But why? So we looked at technical service bulletins that provided the answer for the problem. It appears that some vehicles were built with a VDCM that is affected by normal electrical noise from the ignition switch during engine start. Think about that. Electrical noise from the ignition switch. What's that? What's electrical noise? You ever heard electrical noise? Not having your wires twisted. Huh? I said not having your wires twisted. Would it be kind of electrical? I would hear it on the radio. If you want to see if you've got electrical noise, Turn your AM radio, put, it, put your radio on AM and turn it to the low end of the AM band and it is extremely sensitive to electrical noise in that range. And so if you think there's electrical noise causing a problem, you'll hear it go on the radio. We used to do that. What we would do, we were told when I was doing drivability work eons ago you know, over there at the Ford dealership, uh, that turn that radio all the way to the low end of the AM band whenever you're driving down the road and you got a buck jump and see if you hear something in the AM radio speakers. I mean, it's going to be snowy anyway. You know, we turn it up, and if you hear something like at the same time your problem is there, an electrical noise is probably causing it, or is at least, in a, you know, part of the cause-effect relationship of it. It's pretty cool. Uh, you're going to see on some of these Ford vehicles, Lincolns and stuff that have coil on plug, a bad coil will cause it to do all kinds of crazy electrical stuff on the dash. I mean, if you got one coming in with just all kind of screwball crazy stuff going on electrical system, start looking for a bad coil. <laughs> on the 506 Odysseys, mm -hmm. they, uh, they had a recall for uh, the SRS system. The airbag is going off call, call, uh, because of electrical noise. So, mm -hmm. uh, so if you got electrical noise, make the airbag light off and yeah. punch you in the face like a big boxing glove. So in other words, uh, they said it's in a bracket with a noise reducer. And, yeah. uh, with pull to the bracket and it comes with a little connector. Yeah. Runs off that new harness and plug it in and plug in the connectors and it's fine. Yep. So apparently people have had that problem a lot. So. Yeah, electrical noise is nasty. You know, I mean, problem. if this stuff is not... I mean, I, I stopped to work on one one time that was uh, whenever they would shut it off. I mean, well, she was, uh, this lady was driving it, and she said, when I crossed the traffic circle, my car died. And then I, I went over here to where she was in the parking lot, you know, because she's somebody I knew, and I went over and I opened the hood. And there was a little Oldsmobile, 86 Oldsmobile with throttle body injection, and I pulled the breather off. And when she started it up, the engine almost immediately died. But after the engine died, the injector kept going, just kept spraying. I mean, after the engine died. And then I started smelling something. What's that burning? I smell a, it's an electrical burn here somewhere. And then I looked down there and I saw a little bit of smoke coming out of the engine coolant fan. So I unplugged the engine coolant fan and it was hot, you know, down there. I mean, that, can't, that motor was blistering hot. I said, crank it up. She cranked it up. 
ran this as smooth. Yeah. I plugged in the coolant fan and it started trying to run and make it, and it went because <laughs> that electrical noise was confusing it. And so I said, okay, uh, do this. I said, turn off your defrost and your air conditioner and everything. Just turn all of your, because that was making the fan run, see? So when she cranked it up, it ran smooth. I said, now turn on your air conditioner. So as soon as she did, boom, died. So she needed a fan. <laughs> That's the whole thing. That's electrical noise. You see what I'm saying? Electrical noise will confuse electrical components because they're pretty sensitive. And that's why so many of the times you'll see a shielded, twisted pair that's shielded, and that shield will have a ground that's grounded. And that prevents electrical noise from causing issues. And all your networks are done that way. You know, you're, it's got two wires, if it's a two-wire network. You obviously can't do, you can't twist two wires around each other if there's only one wire, like on a PCI bus or something like that. Okay, now let's let's uh, jump into our test, and we're gonna we're gonna get you guys some some answers here. How about that? Okay. The vehicle dynamics control module uses what to prevent the venting of suspension air when a door is open to eliminate the uh, chance of catching a door on a curb when a vehicle lets down. The door jar switch. Yeah, the, the lamp switch input, basically. Yeah. Uh, on the '97 Continental, uh, it's designed automatically to stiffen the suspension to maintain stability and safety. Under what conditions does it do this? Speed. How about high speeds, y'all? High speeds, y'all. All right. The and the module will turn on the compressor through the compressor relay or open the vent solenoid in response to signal inputs from what? VDCM. No. Wait a minute. You're talking. The module is the VDCM. What's it watching? What's it looking at to see if it needs to change? Right hat. Bingo. Give that man a cigar. All right. Now then, so let's see, the blank test should be used when attempting to measure ride height of the vehicle at or before attempting a wheel alignment operation. Accurate trim. Accurate trim is a correct answer. Mm -hmm. uh, during the blank test, several inputs and outputs of the VCDM are monitored for change of state while harnesses and connectors are manipulated. Wiggle. The wiggle test. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. You guys were listening. Which active control ma command module allows a technician to Pump and vent the air spring solenoids on and off individually. Is it the vent solenoid check ride? Air suspension diagnostic control. That was close enough. Yes. All right. So uh, and when the vehicle speed is less than what miles per hour, full power steering assist is provided? 10 miles per hour. 10 miles per hour. Who said 10 miles an hour? The next time you were supposed to slap yourself, you don't have to. Okay. Yes. Now then. <laughs> Yay. It's good stuff. Uh, during normal operation, the vehicle dynamics control module uses a 45 second averaging interval for the controlling operations. What? Why does it use this interval? One sentence will do. Very good. Very good answer. To prevent unnecessary correct that's a, That is a concise way of saying that. Very concise way of saying that. Very good. It doesn't want an unnecessary correction. Okay, the VDCM will adjust the suspension from plush to normal settings when the vehicle speed exceeds what? 10 miles an hour. Please. 20. Make it up as you go. 30. 85, 40. 95, yeah. 80. 85 oh, miles an hour and adjust the firm setting when it exceeds 95 miles an hour. So you got to be going Mach 2 with your hair on fire, right? Okay, ride steering, yes. ride and steering personality settings are displayed on the dash. message center. You got to do better than dash, Bobby. It's the message center is in the dash. Oh, oh, sure. Okay, now then, we're going to have a little, a little smid, a smidgen of, uh, of a. Uh, this is going to be short. We're going to have a little smidgen of uh, uh, review that's related to what we did on. Um, some of this other air suspension stuff. Let's talk a little bit more. This is test 10. Flip back over to test 10 because it's, it's the same kind of test there. And we're going to burn about five minutes on this. Uh, the four wheel air suspension on the 98 Expedition is controlled by what? Um, huh? No, I mean, this actually gets orders over that, but what's it controlled by? What is it usually controlled by? Give me one word. PCM? Yeah. That's the powertrain control module. What's that got to do with the suspension? Right, what about the four wheel air suspension module? That just seems too easy. That's four watts. Four watts. Right. What was it again? 
again? Height sensors on the Expedition apply a digital voltage to the suspension control module in relationship to the vehicle height. Is that true or is that false? False. False, they're analog. Analog. Right? On that, just like the Lincoln we just talked about, right? Uh, SCP networks, what's an SCP network? Processor. Standard corporate protocol. <laughs> What's a protocol? It's a standard. It's a language. Bingo. It's a computer language, right? Uh, it's just like it's just like uh, Moody says. I guess I just came here knowing everything, you know. So, all right. <laughs> uh, he wasn't talking about coming to automotive, knowing everything, but I just you know I knew everything when I got here. Okay. Well, <laughs> what's ISO? What's an ISO network? Uh, what's, tell me what somebody. Def huh? What's ISO? International Standards Organization, right? Yes. SCP networks require the use of two intertwined wires, while an ISO network uses a single wire to send and receive information. Is that true or is that false? True. I'm going to go with true. Yeah, that, and that was number five, wasn't it? Three. No, that was three. I'm sorry. Ooh, goodness gracious, alive. That's true. That is true. Four, all EVO systems use two primary inputs. What and what? Analog and digital. Come on. I'm not talking about types of you know, inputs. What are the, what's that looking at? We uh, talked about this. Speed. Huh? What'd you say? Speed. Yeah, it's one of them. What's the other one? Rod. No. Nope. Steering wheel rotation. <laughs> Got it. Okay, the next one that there is VAPS 1 and 2 systems use vehicle speed and engine RPM is the only inputs. Is that true or is that false? That is true. Got it? Okay, uh, on the wiring on the 98 Navigator air suspension system uses four primary inputs. What are they? You should be able to tell that, right? Speed. Height sensors, ignition on, door ajar, and transfer case. You guys should remember that from last week. We went over it pretty well. That was height sensors, ignition on, door ajar, and transfer case. Right fast. You have five seconds to finish. Four, three, two, one. All right. When the vehicle is in four-wheel drive low mode, the air suspension system does what? It's hard. Yeah, it, it, well, it, no, it actually raises the vehicle calibrated amount for increased ground clearance. Hmm. Mm. Oh, yeah. So we Got it? it? Really up. Huh? It up. It raises it. It, make, it gives you increased ground clearance by raising it up. Okay, uh, when the, vent, the vent solenoid that allows air to escape from the system during venting actions is located where? Told you about this last week, you better know. Come on, where's the vent solenoid? There's one right behind you up there, right behind your head, Bobby. The vent solenoid right behind your head. It's on the air compressor solar head, there you go. Very good. Okay, now number nine, we're getting close here. Number nine, there are two types of ride control. I love <laughs> driver, in, driver input systems, right? From the, you got it? And road input systems. So you got driver input systems and road input systems. Road input systems use height sensor data and vehicle speed. And driver input systems have inputs from a brake pedal position sensor and a steering wheel rotation sensor along with vehicle speed. You got it? All right. So finally, number 10, uh, after we've all felt like we were going to die here, the EVO system on a town car is diagnosed differently from the EVO system on an expedition. True or false? That is true. And that's the way it is.